Good morning and welcome back to the STS-134 pre-flight briefings. Here this hour, we're going to have a little more information on Endeavour's primary cargo for the STS-134 mission, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. And here to tell us about that, we have Trent Martin, the NASA AMS manager, who's been working to help the AMS team get the instrument ready for space, and Professor Samuel Ting, the AMS principal investigator, a Nobel laureate and professor of physics at MIT. So we'll start with some opening remarks from those gentlemen and then take questions. Trent? Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Trent Martin. I am the AMS uh, project manager here at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, AMS is a large high energy physics experiment uh, designed to look for antimatter, dark matter, and to understand cosmic ray propagation uh, from its perch on top of the International Space Station. Uh, it is a U.S. Department of Energy sponsored payload uh, that is flown on, on shuttle under a memorandum of understanding between the Department of Energy and uh, NASA. is not working properly. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the, the payload itself. So the Department of Energy relies upon uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Professor Ting uh, to, to develop and, and cultivate the collaboration uh, that, we, that we utilize for AMS. Uh, the collaboration is made up of uh, just about 60 institutes uh, from 16 different countries. Uh, each one of those collaboration members provide financial support, uh, collaboration personnel, detector components, um, science and ground support equipment, uh, operational support, scientific analysis, and essentially AMS has as many countries as the International Space Station does, but we use different institutes uh, and different agencies than, than the ISS does making uh, my job and Professor Ching Ting's job uh, somewhat difficult. And we're having some technical difficulties, so. <laughs> so the responsibilities of my office here at, at NASA Johnson Space Center are, are to provide payload integration activities. Uh, NASA is responsible for providing the space shuttle ride to the International Space Station and operations once we're on the International Space Station. Uh, we've been providing continuous support uh, to the AMS collaboration since 1994 when the collaboration began. Uh, we provide numerous pieces of uh, ground support equipment uh, and, and flight support equipment. Essentially, we take the experiment components uh, that are provided by the collaboration, we integrate them into NASA-built uh, hardware that, that attaches them to the space station and also to the space shuttle. Uh, we provide uh, the, the single point of contact between the collaboration and the rest of NASA, whether that be the, the station program, the shuttle program, or the various centers, Kennedy, uh, Johnson, Goddard, et cetera. Uh, we have provided uh, specialized test fixtures, some specialized transportations from all places around the world, and Professor Ting will go into the details of all the different locations around the world where AMS uh, uh, began and, and was constructed. Um, we, we ensure that the payload is safe for launch on the space shuttle and safe for operations on the International Space Station, and we provide a mentoring function for uh, the physicists who, uh, in the beginning, weren't very good at building spaceflight hardware, but <laughs> after uh, this long are actually fairly good at it. Uh, so if I can get uh, picture one up here. This uh, picture shows the AMS sitting uh, on uh, the International Space Station. It weighs uh, 15,251 pounds. Uh, it takes up one quarter of the payload bay in Shuttle Endeavor uh, by, by volume, about one half by mass. It will sit on the S3 upper inboard payload attached site uh, on Space Station, and it utilizes uh, the detector components. We have eight uh, detector components and over 600 onboard computers to analyze the data. Uh, in picture two, this is the AMS sitting in the space station processing facility at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, this picture was taken a few weeks ago. Uh, and in picture three, you can see AMS being loaded into the canister uh, last week as we prepared to remove to move it out to the pad. And in fact, um, earlier uh, this week, we, we unloaded it from the canister out at the pad in the payload changeout room. And tomorrow, we intend on putting uh, AMS into the Shuttle Endeavour payload bay. Um, if you can see picture four, um, you can get a good idea of exactly how AMS works. Essentially, what we're trying to do is uh, 
de detect the charge of a particle, we uh, coupled, we, we essentially take a large MRI-shaped or donut-shaped magnet, um, as similar to what you would find in a, in a hospital for MRI, uh, turn it upright. We put detectors down through the center of the of the magnet system that can tell the a particular particle's uh, mass, energy, velocity, and with coupling it with the magnetic field, we can tell the charge of the particle. So if it's positively charged, it bends one direction in the magnetic field. If it's negatively charged, it bends the other direction in the magnetic field. Uh, next page. <coughs> okay, if we can pull up animation number one. I can't see the animations over here. If we can pull up animation number one. This is the AMS detector itself. Uh, as it's rotating around, the uh, the first thing that you're going to see here, this is the unique support structure. This is the NASA built hardware that it provides the interface between the experiment detector uh, and the uh, space shuttle. This is the magnet system uh, that provides us the, the capability of detecting the charge of the particles. Um, this is the, the payload attached system and the umbilical mechanism assembly. These provide us the mechanical and electrical interfaces to this to the station. This is the transition radiation detector, the uppermost detector of AMS. The time of flight systems, which allow us to detect the velocity of the particles. The tracker system, which is down through the bore of the, of the magnet system and allows us to uh, accurately de define the path of the particles. Uh, the veto counter uh, allows us to um, eliminate particles coming in from the side. Down at the bottom, we have the ring imaging shrink off counter. And the electromagnetic calorimeter is the last detector of AMS. All of that data goes out to the radiators and electronic systems, which are mounted out on the outside edges of AMS. And um, so that's a quick overview of what, of what Professor Ting will go through in, in much more detail. Uh, one, one thing I might note about the uh, permanent magnet that we're using on AMS is it does not uh, interfere with any passing EVA or EVR, uh, EVA crew members or EVR equipment that comes near AMS. Um, Okay, I think we have one more animation. Let's take a look at that animation. Okay, so once AMS is launched on the, on the Endeavour and makes its way to the International Space Station, we will utilize the space shuttle arm to pick AMS up out of the payload bay. Uh, we do an arm-to-arm -arm ha handoff uh, where we use the space station arm to reach over and grab the AMS using uh, grap two different sets of grapple pictures that we have on AMS. Uh, once we do the handoff, uh, we move it over into position uh, above the uh, S3 truss, and we will drop it down. Well, hopefully not drop it down. We'll set it down gently <laughs> onto the uh, International Space Station. Uh, once in place, uh, we connect through, through the umbilical mechanism assembly and attach it electrically um, for electrical and data purposes to the space station. Once on space station, we turn on AMS uh, almost immediately. Um, we'll, we'll prepare the system for taking scientific data, and we can actually be taking data uh, as soon as the power comes on to AMS, uh, so within, within a few minutes, actually. Um, I think that's the last animation that I had. I will now leave uh, the, the rest of the discussion of science uh, to the scientists. And I'll turn it over to Professor Samuel Ting. Uh, Professor Ting is a Nobel laureate from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's been leading uh, the AMS collaboration since its inception in 1994. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to work with him. Uh, I've been working with him since 1995 um, on AMS. And um, I'll let Professor Ting take it from here. OK, good morning. It's nice to be here. Today, I actually got a good badge. I can come in. Um, what I would like, no, first one. What I would like to do today is to share with you the science and the construction of AMS. And the first thing you need to realize in physics, everything appears to be complicated, but the basic idea. It's always very simple. And I hope I can transmit this impression to you. So AMS will be 
the only large physical science experiment on the U.S. ISS National Laboratory. Next one. So what on this picture, it shows the largest accelerator in the world called CERN. It has a circumference of 16 miles. It's about uh, 100 meter to 300 meter underground. And inside, there are 8,000 magnet cooled to near absolute zero temperature. At that temperature, atoms no longer move in the wire, so electricity can go through without resistance. That's what you call superconductivity. And you are able to move large amount of current, therefore generate very high magnetic field. They, not yet. No, 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 please, I, I will tell you. Okay. <coughs> so this accelerator is on the border between France and Switzerland. And this is the place where the entire experiment was assembled. Next one. This accelerator at CERN produced particles of 7 trillion electron volt. But in space, high energy particles has been detected. It has an energy of 100 million trillion electron volt. So 100 million trillion electron volt is much larger than 7 trillion electron volt. This means no matter how large the accelerator you build on Earth, you cannot compete with cosmos. And this, this experiment was done with a detector with area the size of 10 times the city of Paris, measuring a primary cosmic ray, enter into the atmosphere, broke it apart, and so you measure the secondaries. You add up the secondary particles, you know what the primary particle energy is. So the most important idea is the highest energy particle is always produced in the cosmos. Now this experiment, as Twin have said, is a U.S. Department of Energy-led international collaboration. It consists of 16 countries, 600 physicists. It took us nearly 17 years. Besides United States, major countries include Germany. They have an enormous amount of work. In fact, the director of the most important institute in Germany, Professor Scheer, is in here. And if you have a question, you can also ask him. Then there's France. Italy, Spain, Portugal, Russia, Far East, particularly Taiwan, which made an enormous amount of contribution. The realization of AMS depends on three factors. The most important is the strong endorsement of AMS science from reviews by world's leading scientists. Second is a unanimous support from the United States Senate and House. And third, major world support from in Germany, from, from uh, the German Space Agency, from the German equivalent of MIT, RWTH, and from France, from the French Space Agency, from the Spanish Space Agency, from the Swiss ETH, that's a very famous school, <coughs> and from the Swiss National Foundation, and from Italy, from their Institute of Physics, INFN, and from the Italian Space Agency. And in Taiwan, from 
a military institute called CSIST. In the United States, we enjoy very strong support from NASA, from DOE, as well as from MIT. In addition, we are strongly supported by the European Space Agency and by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN. <coughs> Next. So this experiment was reviewed many, many times by the Department of Energy. And the, re the most of the reviewers are Nobel Prize winners, a member of the National Academy of Science. When we were discussing this experiment with the Department of Energy in 1960, 19, 8, 1995, I request to DOE to choose the best physicists to review this experiment because it's a unique thing people have not done before, and therefore it is very important that most critical mind to have examination of it. NASA provide very strong support of AMS from headquarters, from Goddard, from Kennedy Space Center, Marshall Space Center, Johnson's, Johnson Space Center, and also Ames. And uh, NASA administrators, Dan Golden, Charlie Bowden, and also Laurie Garber, George Abbey, and Bill Gestemeyer, all strong support this experiment. I think if my memory is correct, Mr. Gestemeyer must have visited us eight or nine times. Uh, NASA provide two shuttle flights for us even though this is not a, a NASA experiment, and also allow us to use the space station. Most important is NASA provide mission management group, the NASA APO of Mr. Trent Martin and Kim Bowick, which educated us how to do experiment in space. This experiment in the United States also received very strong support from the Department of Energy as well as from the School of Science of MIT. This experiment was proposed started with MIT, and MIT lead and coordinate this experiment. It is MIT group design and construct most of the electronic system, and also work on the design of the two magnet system. Next one. So when you look at a particle detector, it always looks very complicated. So there are many layers. The first layer is called transition radiation detector. It measures electrons and positrons. And then they are followed by time of flight detector, measure the energy and nuclear charge. And then you have a nine layer of silicon detector total area 6.2 square meters, measure the nuclear charge and the sign of the charge in a magnetic field. And then you have another detector called Rich, it measure the energy and charge. And then at the bottom, you have another detector called electromagnetic detector, it measure the energy of electron, positron, and gamma rays. This means most of the properties are measured repeatedly, just to make sure 
they are consistent with each other. So when a particle goes through these different detectors, it leaves different traces, and you can quickly identify them. Next one. The magnet is a permanent magnet. It was provided by the United States Department of Energy and was manufactured in China, uh, let's say in 1996 or so. And the reason is the best permanent magnet material come from Inner Mongolia, which uh, is part of China. I would say they really did a very good job under NASA supervision. Next one. Since cosmic rays going in all random direction, so you need a counter, a ring of counter surround your acceptance detector. And so particles going from the random are rejected. So you want to do this very efficiently. You want the efficiency of 0 0.99999. 9, 9, 9. And that is very, very difficult to do. And this was done in Aachen, Germany. It took them many years to build this thing. Next one. So this is a picture. Oh, you don't see picture, only see me. Yeah. The picture is more. The picture there is more exciting. The picture shows uh, how this detector is manufactured. Next one. Another detector is measure the fly time. Make sure the particle. You only measure the up and down particle. Next one. A major detector that is made in Germany with the participation of the United States and Italy is called transition radiation detector. It used the fact when you have an electron go through layers of radi uh, radiation material and then go through the boundary, it emits light rays. And measurement of this gamma ray shows a electron has go through. No other particle gives this phenomenon. And so the difficulty then is to how to detect this gamma rays. To do that, we developed, mostly in Germany, 9,000 detectors. But in space, you cannot do refill. So you have to make sure this detector are centered correctly and they do not leak. And so out of this 9,000 we built, we put some of them at, in a hospital, in a CAT scan machine, to make sure the detection center, is, uh, the, the wire is centered correctly. And from the 9,000 built, we chose 5,248 of them. And they are centered to 100 micron. And they are leak tight, so when we carry five kilogram of CO2 and 50 kilogram of xenon, we will last for 30 years, so perhaps longer than the space station. And we have done extensive tests to make sure this detector, which is one of the most important detectors, will last for more than 30 years in space without refill. And uh, this picture you could not see. You should look back on there. And it shows the group of a uh, large group of people and the Professor Shale work took 10 years to build this detector. Another detector <coughs> is made out of silicon layers. Total 6.2 square meters in nine layers. And they can measure the coordinate, the position of the particle to one tenth of your hair. And so these were done in special laboratories in Switzerland under microscope. 
as well as special laboratories in Italy. He has taken 50 engineers three years to build this detector. And this is how the detector is installed. You cannot see it again. Uh, installed into the magnet. There are total nine layers. Another detector is made in Spain, in France, and in Italy. In other words, if you speak Latin type of language, you work on this detector. And the previous detector, better you speak German. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> no, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. And this detector uh, used the fact when a charged particle goes through the top of the detector, it emits light. And the angle of the light is a measurement of uh, velocity. Velocity means energy. And the intensity of the light is the measurement of nuclear charge. You know, throughout the periodic table, there's a hydrogen has one proton, helium has two protons. So the charge is always integrals. You, you will not have a fractional charge. So you just identify the charge. Next one. So this detector is very nicely made. It has uh, 11,000 photosensors. <coughs> Next one. Another detector is called electromagnetic calorimeter. It used the fact electrons and light rays because it has a very small mass. So you, when you enter into a piece of lead, you quickly lose its energy. And if you pick up the energy by optical fibers, then you know an electron has appeared. And you can measure the energy of the electron. To do this, uh, this was a technique for this special one, developed in Pisa. And they are, next one. So this is how, this, yeah, this, this is great. This is not making spaghetti, but it's very simple. Huh? Mm -hmm. And shows people making very thin piece of lead, a millimeter, and with one millimeter optical fibers. In total, in total, they are 1,200 pound of lead foils, and with 10,000 optical fiber, one millimeter thick. Next one. So this is the electromagnetic calorimeter, and it's the most sensitive one. It has something called radiation lens, has 17 radiation lens. It's the most sensitive one ever built for space. Next one. So we enjoy very strong support from the European Space Agency. Last year this time, we were not here. We were in Holland. We put the detector into the thermal vacuum chamber and to, to simulate the space condition to make sure the detector will work in vacuum and work in space temperature range. We were there for four months. <coughs> Next one. And then we put the detector into an accelerator. This is the accelerator complex at CERN. The largest one has 27 kilometer. The second largest one is a seven kilometer. And we were put into the seven kilometer accelerator to, sim to produce particles, to, si to see the response of particles in space. And so this is what this detector look like in space from the 8th to the 20th of August. Uh, I should mention, uh, even though we have a very large group, uh, we do have very strong engineering support. And so the time sequence is very well kept. 
and we have a very good support team from Johnson Space Center mm -hmm. who always make sure that every day what is done is carried out. Next one. After the detector was finished, uh, we could not fit the detector into a Boeing 747, it just, unless we take it apart. Okay. And that is not a good idea. Okay. And so we um, were able, through the support of NASA and through the support of Department of Energy, obtain a Air Force C-5 okay, to transport us. Next one. And, uh, this uh, train has shown AMS in Kennedy Space Center. Next one. So there are many discussions in the past about what, whether it's possible to build, to do fundamental science on the space station. You often heard people say, well, the space station is a good adventure to learn uh, to live in space. And what could he do for science? What he can contribute on science can be very simply understood in the following way. In space, there are two types of cosmic rays. One doesn't carry charge, like light rays, like neutrinos. And this has been studied over 50 years. In fact, all our understanding about cosmos come from observation of light rays and neutrinos. But besides light rays and neutrinos, their particles carry charge. Once you carry charge, you must have a mass. Once you have a mass, it's absorbed in Earth's atmosphere. So you never, never measure the original cosmic ray on the ground because you live under 60 miles of a of atmosphere, which is uh, <clears throat> you could have 30 feet of water. So you have to go to space. Now, because it carries a charge, you need a magnet, because positive bends one way, negative bends another way. But put a magnet in space has a one small difficulty, and that is uh, if you have a magnetic compass, one end will always go north, the other end will always go south. So if you're not careful, you put a large magnet in space, soon your shuttle will lose control. And it took a long time to figure out, to design a magnet, it doesn't rotate in space. All the fields are inside, looking from outside, it's like a beer can. Okay, so it doesn't move. And so when I first explained this, to Mr. Golding in 90, in, let me think, it must be May 9th, 1994. And he said, well, this is uh, fine, but uh, why don't we try your little idea uh, on a space shuttle first, mm -hmm. just to make sure everything will be okay. And that's why we have our first flight. The first flight was an engineering flight with with the same magnet, with uh, about the same area of detectors, but less detectors. And it functioned perfectly. And that's why it gives us confidence we can use this magnet. In addition, we have kept this magnet in a <coughs> air conditioned area. And so from 1997, to now, 12 years has passed, more than 12 years have passed, we measure the magnetic field. The magnetic field has not changed at all. And this means this magnet can work on the space station for a period of 20 to 30 years. Next one. So one of the things you can measure because the array of uh, complementary and precision detectors is all the charged cosmic rays, okay, from hydrogen 
to helium. Okay, all the way go up the periodic table. You measure to an accuracy of 1% over the entire solar cycle. This is very important in future if man want to leave the planet, go to Mars, go to Moon, there's a question of radiation. Now the radiation really is not known. There has been balloon measurement, satellite measurement with large errors, 30% errors. With 1% error, measure all the nuclei, follow the entire solar cycle will be done for the first time. We have calibrated detector in accelerator repeatedly just to make sure this will be done first. Next one. Another question is uh, dark matter. We know 90% of the matter in the universe cannot be seen. Because you cannot see it, that's why you call it dark matter. And nobody knows what dark matter is, and you cannot because you cannot see it. But collision of dark matter with each, with each other can produce particles like electrons or like positrons. And so the collision of dark matter will produce positrons and electrons. But collision of ordinary cosmic ray will also produce positrons and electrons. And so if you measure the total positron or electron, the, it will be the sum of these two. Okay. The fact it's the sum of these two means it's more than the ordinary cosmic ray collision. And this gives you a hint, gives you an idea that you finally understood where the 90% of the universe comes from, matter in the universe comes from. So that I already showed, okay. Another important physics question is antimatter. If the universe comes from a Big Bang, before the Big Bang, it is vacuum. Nothing exists in vacuum. So at the beginning, you have an electron, you must have a positron, so the charge is balanced. So you have matter, you must have antimatter. Otherwise, you will not have come from a vacuum. So now the universe is uh, 14 billion years old, okay? we have all of us made out of matter. The question is, where is the universe made out of antimatter? With this experiment, the reason we designed with such, such a large size, with so many layers of re repetitive precision detector, is to search for the existence of antimatter to the age of observable universe for anti-helium, anti-carbon, and we can re distinguish this particle from billions of ordinary particles, like carbon or helium in space. If you think about it, this is not a trivial job. In a city of Houston, during a raining season, you have about 10 billion raindrops per second. Okay. If you want to find one that's of different color, it's somewhat difficult. That's why th this illustrates the precision this detector is going to achieve. Next one. Another interesting new idea, this uh, was uh, first proposed by Ed Wheaton and uh, Jack Sandweiss of Yale is pursuing this new material uh, in space. Now, you must have heard all the matter in accelerator. If you look through the accelerator, you will see the smallest particles are called quarks. There are six different kinds of quarks. 
one called U, one called D, another called S, another called B, another called T. So we know such quarks exist. But it is very, very strange. All the material on Earth are made out of the first two, U and D. So we know in the accelerator, six type exists. But on Earth, you only see the first two. So the simple question you want to ask is, where is the material made out of three type of quarks, U, D, and S? A very simple question, but a very, very important question. See, new, where is the new material? Next. <clears throat> So the issue I just uh, share with you of antimatter in the universe and the origin of dark matter really probes the foundations of modern physics. But to my collaborators, my collaborators and I, the most exciting objective of IMS is to probe the unknown, to search for phenomena which exists in nature, but yet we have not the tool or the imagination to find it. So <clears throat> let me explain to you what I'm saying. Uh, when I received my PhD degree in 1962, uh, the highest energy accelerator in the world. The people decided since to do frontier science. One at, at in Geneva at CERN. Another is at Brookhaven in Long Island. The original purpose of these detectors, uh, of this accelerator, was to study nuclear force. There are many theory how to how to understand nuclear force. But the discovery at CERN is something called neutral current, which eventually leads to the unification of weak forces and electromagnetic forces. At Brookhaven, there were three major discoveries. One is new form of matter, the existence of new form of matter, which is the one I received the Nobel Prize. Another is the breakdown of basic symmetry principle. That was done by Professor Cronin. Another one is, uh, <coughs> let's see, uh, can I take, hmm? Oh, I couldn't see this one. It's, uh, uh, what is this one? Hmm? <coughs> yes, how could I forget that? It's uh, neutrino actually have two kinds. Neutrino is a, a chargeless particle first proposed in the 1930s as massless, only one kind. But this, this, uh, the experiment says, no, there's not only one kind, there are two kinds. In 1970s, the United States built a very large lab laboratory in, in near Chicago called Fermi Laboratory. And the purpose was to study neutrino physics because Brookhaven found there are two kinds. But what was discovered was the fifth quark and the sixth quark. At the at same time, a SLAG, Stanford Linear Accelerator, they built electron positron collider. The original purpose was to study property of electricity, and they really made many important discoveries, and including the fourth family of quark, the third type of electrons, and uh, also find inside the proton there are, po there are many quarks. Then, in 1980s, the largest accelerator for electron positron collision was in Hamburg, called Petra. The original purpose was to look for the sixth type of quark. 
what was discovered was not a sixth type of cork, was something called glue, which bound the corks together. So when you look at all these accelerators, you build accelerator, you ask the best physicists to tell the government what you're going to study. But when you make a precision instrumentation, you do the experiment, your discovery, your fundamental breakthrough always has nothing to do with the original purpose. The idea is very simple because the original purpose is based on existing knowledge. The discovery is to advance the existing knowledge, so it's difficult to predict. And so I think the real purpose of AMS is utilize the tremendous scientific potential of space station and to probe the unknown. So I finish my little explanation. Okay, next uh, we're going to open up the floor for questions. We'll start here in the room, and if you can, please be sure and state your name and organization before you say your question. Oh, thank you, Mark Caro for Aviation Week. Could you sort of explain uh, the, uh, the process of, of activating and how long it takes to calibrate or whatever you have to do to start studies, and uh, how is the AMS controlled? from the ground, where does the science data go, and who manages that for distribution? Thanks. So, so I'll, I'll cover some of the operations portions. Um, once, once, once AMS is uh, put onto the space station, the data comes down through the space station standard uh, data paths, eventually makes its way back to mission control here in Houston. Um, we have a payload operation control center already set up at the pay, at Mission Control here in Houston. Uh, we will operate the payload from that POC uh, for the initial phases of AMS during the shuttle mission and for the initial operations on the International Space Station. Um, we, we operate the payload from there. We uh, turn on different detectors, change power levels to different uh, instruments, et cetera, uh, make sure that the thermal balance is in, is in check. Uh, once the science data comes down, it's checked to make sure that it matches with what we saw uh, on orbit. We then send that data out to various science centers around the world. Uh, once completely operational, uh, that, op that payload operation control center will move to CERN uh, in Geneva. And for the long duration operations of AMS, it will be done out of Geneva, mainly by the AMS collaboration members. Um, yes, I wondered, uh, I guess, there's a, is there a commissioning period when you're sort of tuning, as it were, or, or does, it, does it light up and, and, and work right away with uh, good data? So it's, we, we have a, a several hour period where we're turning on the, the, the power systems, but once, it, once it's turned on, the instruments are operational, uh, we're immediately gathering data. Now, I'll leave it up to Professor Ting to decide how long it takes before he comes back to you with uh, scientific discoveries from that data. Uh, scientific but discoveries, we do not know. But I would imagine within one or two hours, we should begin to receive data right away. We have checked the detector over, over, over again. In fact, <clears throat> we put the detector, we first assemble the detector. The detector has uh, 300,000 channels, so there are an enormous amount of cables, hundreds of thousands of cables. So the first time we assembled the detector was end of 2007, and we cut the cable to the lens. It took six months to put the detectors together. And then we take it apart, it took one month. And second time, we installed it, take one month. And then we took it apart and installed again. We took it apart and installed total two or three times, mainly just to make sure we are thoroughly familiar with all the components. And we also put a detector, each, each of the detector has gone to an accelerator test, and then together, we went to the accelerator test again. 
to make sure this detector doesn't affect the next one. And this was in, was in Geneva twice, once in February last year, and second time in August. And in Kennedy Space Center, we did also tests. And then final last test will be a few days before, before liftoff. With the, uh, then we'll do one more test. So on the space station, it should come back. The data should come back very quickly, within an hour or so, less than an hour. This has happened this is exactly the same thing what we did in AMA, the first flight. In addition to the uh, operations that we do on the International Space Station, when we launch within an about two hours after launch, we will turn on AMS in the payload bay of the orbiter. Uh, we'll ensure that it uh, survived the ride and um, and check out the, the basically thermally condition the payload to ensure that when we're ready to do the arm to arm transfer that we're warm enough uh, that we can do that for there's a stage where we would have zero power onto the payload. Uh, Bill Harwood, CVS, with a couple of questions. The data that comes down, you don't store it on board, right? It's a continuous downlink. Is there a measure of of how much data comes down in a given 24-hour period? Uh, the data come down continuously. Occasionally, there's an interruption of the downlink. So we have uh, a computer on board and also a computer in the detector itself, which has a massive storage. And so in principle, we can store for quite a few months before we can send them down. And for you, you, you never know if the space station stays for 20 years, and you don't know for the next, uh, there will be a few months time, something may happen. So we, this has been taken care of. In fact, the computer store this was delivered by 133. And when the data comes down, goes to Geneva, and we have a, a rather good park on the sock, and we'll, the data will be analyzed as well, and we'll send to Aachen, Germany, to Italy, to Switzerland, to all the places to, to analyze the data. To give, to give you an idea of the amount of data, um, currently with AMS running, well, last week when AMS was running in the SSPF at KSC, we were seeing 400 hits per second of particles. When we get to the International Space Station, we expect to see 25,000 hits per second. Uh, we're gathering data at 7 gigabits per second. Uh, we can't send that huge amount of data down through the uh, space station data systems. It's just too much. Uh, so the onboard computers actually go through a process of uh, condensing that data down to just the data that we're truly interested in, compressing it as much as possible. We send down data uh, on average at about six megabits per second, constantly for the entire time that AMS is on. The computers that Professor Ting spoke of can store up data and we can burst it down at a much higher rate. Um, that allows us to do it at, at less peak times of, of data traffic coming back and forth from station. Dr. Ching, you, you spent an enormous amount of time on this project uh, from birth to getting to this point where you're ready to launch. Um, I know scientists uh, don't get terribly emotional about the hardware, I guess, but this is quite a moment for you personally as well as the team. But what are your thoughts on a, on a personal level that you've finally gotten to this point where this payload is finally going to fly? Uh, if, if you ask me okay, what I do every day, Mm -hmm. uh, my biggest worry, my biggest concern is to make sure the instrument is correct. Because this is different from you do experiment on the ground. If something's wrong, you can send a graduate student to, to fix it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <coughs> and so I indeed spend enormous amount of time thinking what could go wrong. The fact, well, I just mentioned we took it apart and reassembled, one of the purpose of it is this. For the electronics, we have a fourfold redundancy. 
and just make sure one's bad, you will switch automatically to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. You see, with the implication of this experiment is the following. Given the difficulty we have to build this experiment, given the enormous amount of difficulty having international collaboration, and I think in the next 10 to 20 years, nobody will be foolish enough to repeat this again. <laughs> and uh, therefore, it is very important we do it correctly. Because otherwise, you certainly is going to mislead the direction of science. So I think our first obligation, in fact, only obligation, is to make sure the instrument is correct. What you get is the truth. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, you mentioned uh, that it keeps that you are concerned that the instrument is correct and that it works. Uh, in the unthinkable situation that it gets attached to the ISS and some, something doesn't work, what's the recourse? Is there uh, can do you barring graduate students do you send do you send spacewalkers out to uh, to work on it? Is it serviceable no. in space? No. Uh, you only have one person to blame who is sitting in front of you. Uh, there's no recourse. We have this is why we have multi redundancy. Multi redund uh, multi so the detectors measure things differently, hmm? and uh, uh, that is the only thing we can do. A permanent magnet has the good fortune you cannot switch it off. Okay. So the magnet will work, and the transition radiation detector was tested repeatedly. Every detector was done individual space qualification tests, and the whole detector together, the space qualification test. So I suspect, unless somebody drop it, <laughs> then there's a, nothing we can do. And probably the chance of not working probably is quite small. And to follow up with that, when you have a detector that has 300,000 data channels, that means you have 300,000 wires somewhere, right? Um, we looked early on at should we do something modular like we did with Hubble or with other missions, and the complexity within the science experiments was just too difficult for us to do that. However, what we have done is we do have the capability for the non-scientific portions, essentially any data or power systems coming from the space station, we actually have the capability to go out EVA and change some of those things out. If, we're, if we lose power out of one line, we can go out and switch that around. If we lose data from one line, we can go switch that. Uh, but barring those minor uh, adjustments that we can make, uh, the, the experiment detector is just too complex to make it modular. And uh, just as a quick follow-up, um, is there an advantage to where it's being placed on the station? Was there was there a more advantageous place to to attach it to the station, or was it just an open spot where it could go? No, we went through uh, extensive studies on exactly where we should put AMS. AMS is sitting at a site uh, at one of the of the six or seven attached sites. There's one on the mobile transporter as well, but one of the six fixed uh, payload attached sites. The furthest away from the solar arrays, and we actually tilted it 12 degrees. Um, 12 wasn't a magic number, but we tilted it a certain amount of degrees away so that we could actually get the field of view away from the solar arrays so that we would see those in our field of view as, as few times as possible. Um, so we are now sitting in a spot where we cannot move it uh, easily uh, without, without adjusting the rest of the, the hardware that's on space station. We obviously have to be pointed away from the Earth so we can only take one of the three spots on top. And um, this, this was by far the best site for AMS on Space Station. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. Is it possible to have a significant scientific discovery before Endeavour lands? I mean, how long would it take to process this and figure out what's what? Uh, it is, uh, even if we have something new, hmm? You can never predict the future. I think we want to check it very carefully. Yeah. We want to make sure everything is correct. 
I think the chance for making an announcement just for the announcement's sake probably is not what we should do. We want to do it very systematically, very carefully to do that. We are going to have two analysis teams, okay, two independent analysis teams, analyze the same thing and make sure they get the same result. Andrew Chiki with Harvard Journalism. Uh, as a Nobel laureate, can you uh, speak again about your experience with NASA support-wise? And what do you, uh, more importantly, say to other scientists in the States and around the world about accessing the International Space Station as a science research laboratory? You have, please repeat your question, because uh, your second part and first part are, are just slightly disconnected. Right. But your experience with NASA you describe as very good mm -hmm. and strong support. So what do you say to other scientists about accessing the International Space Station as a science research laboratory through 2020? I would imagine if you have a good idea and uh, you will find a way. A good idea means the following. Okay. You have, you have an idea, you write a proposal to the agency, and you ask for a review, and the reviewer will examine your physics or science ideas. Also, a very important thing is, what have you done before? Have you ever made a mistake? Has every one of your experiments has to contribute something, so-called track record. And these are also a good committee, a good peer review should cover that. Because just to, to see uh, a proposal, you can write whatever you want, and then it's difficult to, to judge things. I would imagine if there are good ideas, the space station is really extremely useful thing because it's size, it can support heavy weight and provide power. Really it's a very useful thing for fundamental for fundamental research. Eric Berger with the Houston Chronicle. Following that up and then I'll have an additional question. Is that the primary reason why the AMS had to be on the station was its power needs? Power and weight. If you go on a satellite, right, you're going to have to build, uh, you're going to have to build, you have to find a rocket, carries uh, seven and a half tons of load, and you have to build a, a solar power to provide 2,500 watt, and you have to provide data transmission and this will be enormously costly. In fact, this question was asked of me a year ago when a physicist called Steve Hawking showed up, visited me, uh, spent the half afternoon with me. Okay. After my little explanation, he only had one question. I was <laughs> the same question. Well, well, that's very flattering. Thank you. Um, no. <laughs> the, the, the second question I would ask is, is this has been a long and winding road for you, 17 years, and you're essentially trying to sell bean counters, not at NASA and Congress, um, on something that we think we're going to find something really exciting, but we don't know what it is. So maybe talk about sort of the challenge of of, of ba selling basic science in a results-driven, what-can-you-do-for-me-now world of, of politics and, and funding? Uh, I, this similar question in a slightly different form, a different form is asked of me every time I had on a meeting press. Hmm? Uh, what, it, what drives the physicist is a curiosity. Hmm? To, to try to find something new. And I personally, for me, 
I never had any financial problems. People look what, what I've done before, what my collaborators have done before, and people will support us. You ask a very important question, why there's settling countries go through such a torturous road to reach today. In this settling years, there's a, a period of time we were not even on the manifest. And why the German physicists, the Italian physicists, and why the United States Department of Energy, why MIT, continue to support us? It's because they believe such an important science must be done. So I don't have any legal authority over any funding agencies. People work with, work together because they are curious. They want to find what the dark matter is, whether there's antimatter or not. And the question you ask, what is good for? What you can use it for? You spend so much effort. A uh, hundred years ago, when X-ray, when electron were first discovered, and that was, that was just pure scientific research. Nobody thought it would be used today. In 1930s, the so-called useless science is quantum mechanics, and uh, atomic physics now is used for <coughs> for your cell phone, for your laser, for all the transmission, for for your for the IT. In the 30s and 40s, we study the sun, and then now now is used for many things. I study also planets now used for GPS. So from the observation of a new phenomenon to the discovery normally has a period, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, maybe 30 years. Once it is used, it changes everybody's life. But during this road of developing new technology, developing new science, you develop many new technology. A very good example is World Wide Web. It was discovered at CERN, which really affects everyone's life. I think uh, so that really the direct benefit to society. But for scientists, at least for me, the main reason is curiosity. I'm sure my good friend Professor Scheer, which, uh, who is here, shared this, the same, the same passion, because we want to find out what is going on. Hi, um, I'm Irene Klotz with Reuters. Um, I had a couple questions for um, uh, for um, Mr. Martin. Um, the, uh, the power requirements for AMS um, are pretty extensive, and I was just curious if there's any problems, like not as severe as what happened with the cooling system shut down uh, last year, but is there some um, prioritization of what experiments get power in case there's not full power available? Yes, ab absolutely. On the space station, uh, if there's an emergency, uh, there, there's a set of priorities. Who gets shut off first? Who gets shut off last uh, in, those, in those systems? And we work within that system to identify uh, AMS is in this configuration right now. Our temperatures are set at this at this level. We can be shut off for this amount of time before we start to harm scientific experiment components. Um, and that, so that goes on during a regular, ongoing basis in operations. Um, and yes, they they set that up well ahead of time, and we know where we are in that uh, in that order. Where are you? Just where payloads are considered one of the lower order items. They they're the, some of the first things that get shut off. Uh, AMS, because of its large power requirement and need to, to run constantly, is higher up in that in that prioritization, but still down with the with the payload. Obviously, you don't want to shut off the ECLS system um, first before you shut off a payload. Um, but 
but we we're certainly down in that in that range. Thanks. We can also operate at lower temperature, at lower uh, power settings, just to maintain a minimum keep alive power if we needed to. So we could operate just the thermal systems, just turn on things to make sure that nothing freezes. Thank you. And um, for Dr. Ting, um, the uh, the substitution of the the magnet, the permanent magnet. I know that. That all worked out really well, considering stations being extended. But could you just uh, uh, clarify if the helium tank problems had any um, any impact on the decision to switch? And also, are there any plans for a um, for using the AMS um, cryo magnet in like an AMS three? Thanks. Uh, answer the second part. AMSO two, presumably will last 20 years. The space station that people talk about ending in 2028, at least 2020. So indeed, there are many people talking about AMSO3, but uh, perhaps for me, this is not my highest priority at this moment. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> when we were approved, space station has not been has not started, and we were given three years. And uh, there was a very clear understanding between DOE and NASA. We were to be on the space station for three years. Afterwards, we'll be returned to Earth. Another experiment will come on. I think an experiment was identified called access, if my memory is correct. Hmm? So we designed the magnet for three years. It is very difficult to build such a magnet. Nobody has ever succeeded, because you need to cool such a low temperature. Hmm? So we had many technical challenges, but we managed to finish them. And we test them in the thermal vacuum tank in S tank. Because you cannot test them in the laboratory. In the laboratory, the outside temperature, and you have air, and so conduct the heat. So, so you, never get a, you never get a reliable answer until you go to the thermal vacuum tank. You, you pump down uh, the vacuum tank, and you cool down the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the environment temperature to simulate the space. We were there for quite, quite some time until the temperature in the tank is stable to point 0 0.0001 degree per hour, namely extremely stable. And then you can see okay, how much heat is going to come in to, to lose it. And that turned out to be, I think, close to three years, 28 plus minus six months. So that should be OK, because in space, whether it's two years, you, if you approve for two years, for three years, you work for two and a half years, you, you get the same data. <coughs> when we finished this, I remember very clearly it was April 16th last year. And there was an announcement the space station will go to 2020, maybe go to 2028. And then my colleague and myself realized there's no more shuttle, so there's no refill. There's no more shuttle to bring back. If we don't do something, this will become a museum piece. And that's why we made a decision to change the magnet. We have studied this change before, during the period when we were off the manifest. We were thinking of going up with a satellite, uh, going up with a rocket. <coughs> so we know the procedures. Unfortunately, very fortunate for us, in Aachen, in the first Institute of Physics in Aachen, Germany, where Professor Scheer is the director, they have a very precise machine shop. 
And we were able to do that very, very quickly. How long was it? A few weeks. Hmm? Six weeks. Six weeks we changed the magazine. But we have understood the step. It's, it's not we have started at random. We've understood the steps, and then we, to compensate, the magnet's weak. We add more detectors, and that also was done very quickly in Germany and in Italy. I think we were within one day of our schedule. <coughs> Um, Marcia Den, Associated Press. Um, for either of you, I'm wondering if $2 billion is still the most up-to-date, accurate figure for the cost of the AMS, and are there also annual operating costs that you're able to share with all the different countries involved? Okay, so <laughs> calculating the cost of AMS is difficult, right? <coughs> simply because we have all the different institutes. Many of the, many of the institutes provide in-kind work, or they only provide uh, you know, three grad students and a professor, and they don't tell us how much those cost. Um, so over the years, I've been asked multiple times to come up with the cost of AMS. Two billion dollars is the number right now that I would say AMS has cost since the beginning, since 1994. Um, there are annual operating costs. Um, most most of those are, are borne by the by the collaboration themselves. Once they move the the payload operation control center to CERN to Geneva. Uh, as they man that uh, with uh, 12 to 15 people per shift, uh, 24 hours a day. Um, so that gives you an idea of the, the number of people that they will have to have in place uh, just for the operations. And obviously, they'll, they'll share some of the duties of operations as well as science analysis. Um, and uh, I'll leave it to Professor Ting on the, the science, science teams that will be throughout the world. Clearly, those will cost something as well, mostly borne by each one of those institutes. Mm. Uh, it, it's uh, very difficult to estimate because there's a, a tremendous difference in each country how people get paid. Mm. And, and uh, then you touch this, you become a very sensitive subject. <laughs> mm. And so NASA, what NASA has done is if this is to be done in NASA. Oh, am I right? How much this will cost? Right. We, we essentially took the total number of man hours and said, here's a typical man hour rate if we were doing it here in the States. We'll assume it's the same in Taiwan or in Spain or in Germany. And we'll multiply out the numbers and we'll come up with the, with the final number. The operating cost for NASA over the next uh, few years will be minimal. Um, less than a million dollars a year for us to, to man the, the equipment that we need here. That's obviously not counting the space station cost, the fact that space station is up there, but for my office, the, the cost will be minimal. Uh, Jim Oberg for NBC News. I know your general plan is to just watch the sky for what falls into the detector. Do you have any models in which you might want to aim at a specific area of the sky for some specific astrophysical event that's going on that you might want to ask the station, <clears throat> can you go look at this location? Uh, at this moment, uh, not yet. Because for a charged particle, it bends in the intergalactic magnetic field. You know, between the galaxies, there are magnetic fields, and since you don't know that, you don't know where to point. The pointing is not important. It is important when we measure very high energy light rays. Okay? Indeed, we have a GPS system. We have two very precise star tracker. So we for, we also measure light rays at extremely high energies to trillion electron volts with very high accuracy. Because I mentioned at the end, we have a stack of 17 radiations of uh, detector, specially measure, measure light rays. And for that, okay, indeed, if it's something new at very high energy, we may come to present this to NASA to ask for a, a special orientation. But at this moment, no. <coughs> 
I'm sorry, we don't have time for follow-ups, so. Hi, Clara Moskowitz with Space.com. And I know that you've talked about the long saga of getting final approval for this experiment. And for a while, the question of whether or not the SGS-134 flight would even go up was up in the air. Can you talk about what you felt when you learned that this flight was actually going to launch your experiment? Well, it's better he answer. I was thinking it was better he answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we knew, we, we were asked, at NASA, at JSC, we were asked to continue processing the payload as if it were going into the shuttle. Uh, we were also told that we didn't have a shuttle um, in the same breath. It was, uh, it was difficult, and it was difficult to keep the team together. And so just the, the mere fact of adding STS-134 was a relief to my team, uh, who had been continuously working on this, not knowing whether or not they had a mission. Hi, Mike Cronin from The Daily. Uh, we know that we don't know what dark matter is. We know a little bit about antimatter, but have a little fun with this question. What do you think we might find uh, using this AMS about dark matter, and what might uh, that knowledge lead us uh, to do, uh, whether it's interstellar travel or uh, the existence of opposite charged uh, beings that mirror ourselves or something like that? You don't want me to answer this question. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, 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 because I'm not qualified. Mm -hmm. Any phys most physicists who predict the future normally end up regretting. But it's very difficult to predict the future. My responsibility and the responsibility of my senior collaborators is to make sure the instrument is correct. Because the detector is so sensitive Everything we measure is something new. We want to make sure it's done correctly. Speculation is dangerous. Okay, I think we have one question at Kennedy Space Center. Yeah, just one. Todd Halverson of Florida Today. I'm just wondering if Professor Ting can uh, uh, speak to the difference in capabilities of the cryo magnet and the permanent magnet, please. Yes, very good question. Permanent magnet does not require power supply. And because its weight <clears throat> is so massive, it doesn't, the temperature is easy to keep a constant. Require no maintenance. And uh, our permanent magnet, we have shown in 12 years, the magnetic field has not changed. And therefore, in 20 to 30 years, we will keep it the same magnetic field. The disadvantage is the field is much weaker, five times weaker than the superconducting magnet. To compensate that, we put in more detectors and more longer arms, so increase the measurement accuracy. And so the detector resolution with the permanent magnet is not compromised. Have I answered your question? I think so. I think that is the end of our briefing today. Next up, coming up on NASA TV at 11 a.m. Central Time, we'll have the STS-134 Mission Overview Briefing. Thanks so much, and we'll see you later.